So this story here is published on um, Knoxville News, 10 News, Unsolved Appalachia. Appalachian Unsolved Cross-Country Trip Ends in Canadian's Mysterious Death. He just took off. He didn't leave an explanation. He didn't write a note. He just up and left and ended up dead in Knoxville, Tennessee. Now, this is, I don't know if this was a quote from a family member, but that's not exactly true because in the week leading up or two weeks or so leading up to him disappearing or taking off, um, he had tried to cross the Canadian border into the United States and he was denied access because he had a huge sum of money. And um, he was probably acting suspicious because he was, he, he'd had some kind of a break or something was happening to him. It's possible that the things he was saying were true, that someone was out to get him and were trying to kill him. And this is the reason why he was trying to flee into the United States. Uh, he was turned away and turned back, and he tried to get a friend to help smuggle him across the border, and they told him that they couldn't help him. So here's this story. The author is Leslie Ackerson. Investigators are reanalyzing the clues in a Canadian man's cross-country road trip that ended in his death. Blair Adams, age 31, had a clean record. What was going to be another long July day on a construction site in Knoxville, Tennessee, began with a gruesome discovery. Um, at first we thought maybe he was alive but and that he needed medical attention, says one construction worker, but as we began to, inv to inspect him, we realized that he was dead. He had been severely beaten. He was found on a construction site of what is now a Firefield Inn uh, hotel off of Strawberry Plains exit. He was definitely struck in the head. It looks like he had his hands up trying to fight off someone attacking him. Um, it looks like he had road rash, like he had been dragged behind a car or a motorcycle, although there was no indication of that. Uh, Knoxville Police Chief, cold case investigator Davin David Davenport said um, he was struck hard in the hands, so he had been fighting off an attacker. It's a very strange circumstance, and we're trying to find out what led up to this. This all began in his hometown in Vancouver, Canada, where he rented a car and drove 200 miles to Seattle. Now keep in mind, just a few weeks prior to this, he had tried to cross the border and was turned away. He went to a friend and asked, is there any way you can help smuggle me across the border? They, would, they said, I'm sorry, but I can't help you. I don't know if they reported this to his family. In one report, I read that he had just left his job, did not return to work. In another report, I read that he went to his job and got his last paycheck and then quit his job. So, I don't know which one of those is true. Um, he purchased a one-way ticket to Washington, D.C. And when he arrived in Washington, D.C., he rented another car. This is where the road trip began to um, Knoxville, Tennessee. It wasn't unusual, according to his mother, for him to go off and be with friends or just take off for a few days. Um, she doesn't know why he was in Knoxville. He, as far as she knew, he, he had no family there, no friends. Um, this Travel was normal for him because he had spent quite a bit of time in Europe working on construction sites. Now, here's one theory. This man worked as a construction worker himself in Canada, and he worked for a company that did send him to different locations around different countries and parts of the world to work. 
Some people believe that he had some kind of a mental break with reality. Or maybe he had had some kind of a bipolar break with reality or whatever it could have been. But the fact that he was found on a construction site and that was his line of work, it's possible that he became very disoriented and confused and stumbled upon this construction site thinking this was his workplace. I don't know. This is just a speculation. His mother also said it was possible that he was going to the Olympics in Atlanta. He talked about doing that. Travel was normal for him. Um, like I said, he emptied his safety deposit box before he left home. He had been acting strangely. His girlfriend said that he had been acting strangely. He was found partially closed from the waist up, meaning that he was naked from the waist down. He was laying on top of his shoe as though his shoe had been... He had placed his shoe under his head or someone else had as some type of pillow. Um, he had been beaten with some type of metal bar. It's possible that he had been stomped on and even run over. Surrounding his body was a large amount of cash in German, Canadian, and American currencies. He also had a fanny pack on him containing gold coins and jewelry amounting in thousands of dollars. They found his passport, his driver's license, and his credit card. This was not a robbery of a or a, a beating, a death from robbery, unless it happened that someone pulled onto the web or, or pulled onto the parking lot at the time that this was taking place and scared this person and they took off on foot. If that were the case, nobody reported seeing this, and maybe they were scared and they left. But whatever the reason, this this man was not robbed. You know. Um, Hundreds of yards from his body um, were m money and other pieces of his property, his passport and other items. It's almost as though his body had been thrown from a vehicle as it was moving. Um, he could have had something on him that the killers took that his family just was not aware of. But at the very least, these people, if this was a robbery, they would have taken. The jewelry would have been something they could have quickly pawned. And the cash, the American cash, would have been something that they would have definitely have taken. Um, so it makes no sense that some people have pointed to prostitutes and drug dealers. But once again, people, I mean... If this were the case, you'd know that these people definitely would have taken the money. Okay, so it says that a toxicology report showed that he had no drugs in his body. So he either met up with someone or ran into someone that caused his death. I don't know that it was a planned meeting or a chance meeting. While DNA was still in its earliest stages, detectives did collect one piece of evidence that could bring answers today. We were able to recover a strand of hair, and we have made some DNA evidence of that hair. We just have not been able to find a match. It is frustrating at times when you reach a dead end. Um, this is really all that they have to go on at this point. There were reports. Uh, some people, once his picture was put in the paper, and people started asking, did anybody know about this? What was this about? Um, some people came forward and said they remembered seeing this man in a restaurant with another man. Now, whether or not he was with another person or if he was just ran into someone else and asked you know for some 
um, information. Maybe he was asking this person, you know, do you know where I can... I don't know. But... Right now, this is just... It's so strange. Because it's like... Someone murdered this man, beat him to death for no no visible reason or clear reason because it wasn't for robbery. Um, no, you know, I mean, he had a fanny pack on his on his body or laying next to his body, full of gold coins and very expensive jewelry, and nobody bothered to take any of that. Nobody bothered to take the money. Nobody bothered to, uh, you know, try to conceal this man's identity by taking his passport and his driver's license. I think that this was a... I don't know. Part of me and, and some of the theories that I've read on Reddit, some of the people in the threads have said that it sounds like maybe this man had some kind of mental break. Um, being the age of 31, I don't know if his family had ever or if he had any history of having any kind of bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, anything like that. But it's possible that he had something going on mentally. He believed that someone was out to kill him, that he had told people that someone was after him. And that's possible. Maybe somebody did. Maybe this man witnessed something. Maybe he knew of some kind of shady, underhanded deal going on at his job place. And somebody, you know. There's a lot of theories as to what happened. This is from Wikipedia. Prior to the murder, Blair Adams, a resident of British Columbia, Canada, withdrew all of his money from his bank account, emptied a safety deposit box of gold, platinum, and jewelry, and attempted to enter the United States via furry. Immigration officials flagged him as possibly being a drug mule or a drug courier due to the large amount of cash that he had on him. Um... He was denied entry in the early morning hours of July the 9th. Adams was discovered by Border Patrol officers attempting to cross the border on foot at the Pacific Highway border crossing. Um, officials noted that he had scratches on his legs and hands, and he matched the description of a man implicated in an automobile theft. Um, so something was causing this man to be so in fear that he was willing to try to steal a car and try to cross the border. Um, he managed to enter the United States by car on July the 10th. He rented a Nissan Altima from the Vancouver International Airport and arrived in Seattle. He then purchased a round-trip ticket to Frankfurt, Germany. Um... He had previously worked on a project in Frankfurt for his uh, stepfather's construction company. He also had friends in Germany and had dated a woman there. Um, this woman was interviewed and she told law enforcement he had made no contact with her about coming to, for a visit. Um, so... Once he arrived in Seattle, he traded his round-trip ticket to Frankfurt, Germany to a one-way ticket to Washington, D.C. Upon arriving at the Dulles Airport in Washington, he rented a Toyota Camry. Um, during his road trip through the state of Virginia, he accidentally backed into another motorist's car the other driver said that he seemed my, he seemed nice, but seemed to be in a hurry. 
he exchanged information and gave them the name of the rental company and he went on his way. He arrived in Knoxville, Tennessee sometime that same evening. The first sighting reported of him in Knoxville was at a gas station in Strawberry Plains at about 5.30 p.m. An interstate repair service driver had been called to the gas station. He told the clerk that he was having difficulty with his car key and was unable to enter the vehicle. When the tow truck driver arrived, he realized that Adam's key was for a different car. He had the key to the Nissan so apparently he had he had abandoned the Nissan in Seattle. He didn't bother to take it back to the rental place. He still had the key to this Nissan and was trying to use it to start the Toyota. Um, the tow truck driver told him to check all of his pockets. He said, if you drove this thing in here, you have to have the key. And I thought he was a little nuts, says the... Uh, Gerald Sapp, the repair service driver, he was bound and determined to, to make that Nissan key work in that Toyota car, and I told him that the only other thing he could do would be to have the car towed, which he did. He had it towed to a repair shop, and uh, Gerald Sapp says that he dropped Adams off at the Firefield Inn in Knoxville. Upon his arrival, he was captured on closed-circuit television in the hotel lobby. He spent about 45 minutes loitering around the hotel before he decided to purchase the room. Uh, he gave the clerk a $100 bill, and when they attempted to return his change, he left. He turned away and walked out of the lobby, and that was the last time that they saw him. He never entered the hotel room. He never activated the key card that would enter, or the key that would enter the room. At 7.30 a.m. the next morning, his body was discovered by construction workers in a parking lot of an under-construction Firefield Inn location outside of Knoxville at the Strawberry Plains exit. He was half-naked. His shirt was ripped open. His paints was gone. Uh, his paints and underwear and everything were there, and they said that they had been pulled off in such an uh, emotion as though they were turned inside out. So either he pulled them down himself from the waistband or someone else pulled them off of his body from the waistband because they were pulled in, they were turned inside out. Um, his shoes, paints, and socks were laying around his body. Scattered around his body were German, Canadian, and U.S. currency totaling around $4,000. So someone could technically have taken some money. Maybe they just didn't have time to grab it all up in a hurry. Um, but if that much money is laying around, maybe it being dark, they couldn't determine what was American and what was German. And maybe this wasn't about a robbery to begin with. Is it possible that in his state of mind, in his confused state of mind, he starts talking crazy and maybe he tried to attack somebody and they were defending themselves? Uh, it could have been someone also... If this man was in a restaurant, as it was reported earlier, that he was witnessed walking around in a restaurant, and I read one report where they believe that he was even trying to use a payphone in, in some restaurant. Could it be that he might have pulled money out of his pocket and someone followed him? You know? But then again, where, why didn't they take the money? Um... He had travel receipts for his guys and other items that he had bought. He had purchased a black duffel bag. Um, the black duffel bag was found with the body, and it, con it contained maps and travel receipts, a fanny pack com containing five ounces of gold bars, gold and platinum coins, his keys that he earlier said he couldn't find, 
According to the autopsy report by the University of Tennessee Medical Center, Adams had sustained many cuts and abrasions. The Knox County Sheriff's Department was able to ascertain that the wounds came from fending off an attack. Adams suffered a violent blow that ruptured his stomach. His official cause of death was ruled sepsis from abdominal perforation. He also had a very deep wound to his forehead, which police believe was caused by some kind of club or crowbar. It is suspected and evidence suspected that he had been sexually assaulted. Um, the police were unable to confirm whether or not they were able to, to find DNA of this assault. So, law enforcement initially suggested the possibility that his death had been sex-related since he was almost completely nude. The only physical DNA found was strands of hair that he had gripped in his hand. According to family and friends who were interviewed, he had been acting very oddly in the weeks leading up to his death. Um, he had recently stopped attending Alcoholics Anonymous meetings. He had been telling friends that someone was trying to kill him. He confided in his mother that someone was spreading rumors about him. This could be that he was having some kind of break with reality. Maybe, or maybe somebody really was out to get him. Like I said, maybe he discovered something going on at his job and that he was. they were afraid that they were going to be, you know. It could be these construction companies. Maybe a bad inspection. Maybe somebody was paid off, you know. There's a lot of different theories. Um, according to his family and friends, he had been sober for two years, but had recently stopped attending meetings. There was no one who came forward to say that they knew that he had gone back to drinking again, and it was not believed that he had alcohol in his system. Um, the Knoxville Police Department, Department received only one tip surrounding this death and they can't say whether it's credible or not. They did make a composite sketch of a man who um, a man and two women claimed to have witnessed Adams speaking to a man outside of a Cracker Barrel restaurant in Knoxville. Um, the case was featured on a 1997 episode of Unsolved Mysteries and as of today, there has been no update. So this man's name was actually Robert Dennis Blair Adams. But his family called him Blair. He had a history of alcohol and substance abuse, but he had been clean for two years. According to some friends, he was he was very much a gentleman, but he had been known to become aggressive and confrontational. It's it's possible that he had an undiagnosed mental health crisis. As I was reading another article on this, some theories were that, being that he was thirty one years of age. Um, it's said that oftentimes when people, and, and most people who are bipolar are men, and it's reported that sometimes schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, makes its first appearance in people in their mid to late 20s, early 30s. He may have had a few episodes like this before, and people may have just said it was because he was an alcoholic. But he could have had some kind of a break, you know. So, it just goes on to say that he, 
had a girlfriend in, Ca in Germany that he lived with for a while. But he returned to the United States. He got control of his drinking, began to attend meetings, and was doing much better in life. He was well liked at his job. His, his co-workers um, all said that he was a hard worker, did a good job. But it was reported on some occasions that he was a little bit careless and that his, toward the end of, before he left this job, he had started to slide a little bit on his, um, you know, showing up late for work, not showing up for work. That could have all been part of this mental break, you know. Now, there is one video of him on closed circuit TV at the hotel. This is on YouTube, and it just shows him walking around the um, hotel lobby. The clerk is at the desk. He comes in. He goes back out. He comes back in several times. He's going in and out different doors. He'll go out one door and then comes back in another door. He's carrying this backpack. And it's just more or less him wandering around for about close to an hour before he finally came over and rented a room. But it was shown that he never went to the room. When he paid for the room and he left the hotel room, and left the hotel lobby, he just went on to wherever it was that he went, you know. Um, now here is something that is reported in this story that wasn't in any of the others. His shoes were off and laying near him, but his socks had been stuffed inside of his shoes. Now, that sounds to me like somebody who undresses their self, you know? I mean, a lot of times you take your shoes off, you stuff your socks down inside your shoes. Is it possible that he was so out of his mind that he thought he was at the hotel and he's just getting undressed? I don't know what the heck was going on. Maybe he did go there to have a hook up with somebody, you know? Maybe he was having a experience or whatever. I don't know. But if it were a prostitute, a john, a pimp, whatever, they more than likely would have robbed this man. That would have been their main focus was let's get this money, you know. Let's just grab it now and, and we'll divide it up later. Let's, you know, if it's Canadian or German money, we'll dump it. So they, the medical examiner estimates that his time of death was around 3.30 a.m. This was about four hours before his body was found. Um... Now there was a a worker on the premises of this of this construction site that night. He was a security guard and he did claim to have heard a scream sometime during the night, but he thought that it sounded like a woman. Um, did he go walk around looking? Hey, who's out here? Who's screaming in the middle of the night? Um, he died from a blow to his stomach. It was a really hard kick. This is what they believe because um, bruising and stuff on his body didn't really indicate that this came from like a crowbar, but it could have. Maybe this man took him there with the intentions of, I'm going to show you around town. I'm going to help you get back to your hotel. Maybe the guy didn't know where he was at. He was disoriented or whatever. Not Maybe he had had something to drink. And maybe this guy just took him out there, lured him out there. But, I mean, <laughs> maybe he was a serial killer, you know? I don't know. Most serial killers don't kill in that manner. They would have taken him someplace where they could have hid his body away, you know. Please know that this was not a suicide because of the cause of death. What happened to Blair Adams between the hours of 7.30 p.m. 
and 3.30 a.m. We do not know. Now today, if this happened today, they would have been able to trace his steps because of cameras all around different businesses. If he left the fire field in, there probably were cameras. There would have been cameras in the parking lot at the entrance of the hotel going out onto the street. Restaurants, bars, grocery stores all have cameras. And if they had them back then, I don't know if they searched them. And a lot of times back at that time, these videos were just, um, they would, you know, record over themselves. Is that maybe he walked outside to go find dinner and ended up at Cracker Barrel down the street where the two women saw him talking to this man. They say that they did not find any drugs or alcohol in his system upon his autopsy. And his stomach contents contained lettuce, meat, and shrimp. So his stomach contents indicated that he had eaten within a few hours of his death. Um, another option the police considered is that the area near here is next to a truck stop and attracted individuals with a transient lifestyle. Uh, maybe something went wrong and someone followed him and he became afraid and began to run, to hide, and, but once again, this man had thousands of dollars, and we all know that if you're living on the streets and you're a transient, a prostitute, or anybody of that lifestyle, you're going to take that money, so there has to be something more to this, you know, the fact that he bought a ticket to Germany and then at the last minute decided, uh, but it could have been planned out. Maybe he wanted to throw somebody off. I'm going to Germany. I'm buying a plane ticket to Germany. And then, instead of going to Germany, he waits until he gets to Seattle, changes that plane ticket to Washington, D.C., which is very weird. Because if he was... Was his intentions to drive to Atlanta, as his mom had suggested? Um... Would he have gone through Tennessee, through Knoxville, Tennessee? Or was he planning to get another plane on another plane? Nobody knows. But him changing, um, the abandoning the car, this was two different cars. One, he reportedly stole a car in Canada trying to cross the border. Another, he rented the car and abandoned it in D.C., didn't turn it in, or um, didn't turn it in in Seattle, rather. Rented the car in. Maybe his plan was, by lose, saying that he lost the key to this car in Tennessee, his plan was to abandon that car to throw people off, you know. The number one theory, according to this person, is I think that the back and forth trying to go to Germany and then the U.S. back and forth indicates that he felt someone was after him. Friends admit that he did say this often and witness report him acting very paranoid, although no evidence was found to support this theory. There were no threats. There were no messages. There was no trace of him being involved in any kind of illegal activity. He wasn't into drugs. He had no indications that he uh, had he'd had no alcohol in his system that night. Um, he had one assault conviction, but they believe this was just a, a matter of a drunken brawl kind of a thing. It wasn't like that he was a violent person. Um, and that's it. That this is the history of this case. This is what we have. And nothing more has come out about this in however many years ago this took place. If the DNA from that strand of her, if they did take any DNA from his cavities to see if he had been sexually assaulted, they've not put that out there. 
and um, this strand of hair in his hand could have been, you know, I mean, if they entered it into the system and nothing is matching, but if they enter it into, like, Jed Match or one of these, eventually, if there's enough DNA to match anybody else, it's going to get a hit somewhere. It may be a third or fourth cousin, but that's how they narrow these things down, you know. They would find out who this person was, then they would do more matches. They try to get as close to the person as they could get. And then from there, they start doing their foot search, you know, their phone calls. Um, do you have a family member that would have been in Knoxville, Tennessee in 1996, you know? Is this a male her or a female her? Are they able to determine that? You know? So that's where this case stands. It's very mysterious. It's very odd. And like I said, I stumbled upon this solely by accident. But it, it became like this rabbit hole, you know? Here's one guy's theory from Reddit. I think I might be able to explain the Blair Adams case. Let me see if I can get this to come up. This is from the user. Um, this is on Unresolved Mysteries. It doesn't have the user's name. I'm a guest here at this Reddit and I'm no expert. I might watch an Unsolved Mystery video on YouTube once in a while, but I'm way out of my jurisdiction here. Yesterday, I came across a video created by the YouTuber Lazy Masquerades. He covered a multiple rabbit hole mystery surrounding Blair Adams. I feel like in his last days and his death have been blown way out of proportion. Now, here is something that he and I agree on. I don't know who wrote this, but I do agree with this guy or woman. Adult onset schizophrenia is very rare before puberty. It's also very rare for a person over the age of 45. At the time of his death, Adams was 31. I'm sure you're all familiar with this case and the very bizarre behavior surrounding this case. How quickly did this all escalate? Of all the odd behavior he, he was documented having from his own mother said someone is spreading rumors about me, but he never said who. Um, the fact that he rented multiple cars and plane tickets and seem to end up in random locations. Um, so th this person is sharing their story. I have a personal story that I think may shed light on this. My brother is severely mentally ill. Back in 1999, he was having an episode. This was just before he was diagnosed as a schizophrenic. One day he thought he had he thought a barcode on the back of a can of soda was telling him to drive to Maine because someone was trying to kill him. And that's exactly what he did. He starts driving, he's reading license plates. He says the license plates have secret messages and they are all telling him different locations to drive to to end up at the border of Canada. Uh, long story short, the poor guy ended up in a jail cell in Oklahoma. He had a substantial amount of cash on him, plane ticket, a train ticket, and some also a handful of jewelry. When asked why he had all this money and jewelry on him, he said he didn't want anyone to steal it and that he needed to stay on the run from the CIA because they were trying to kill him. Now, her theory, or his theory, is is that Adams was probably going through a similar episode of, of onset schizophrenia, 
which I, I kind of think that that could be a possibility. But however he ended up dead, the only thing I can say is that his schizophrenia may have freaked somebody out so bad when he went into some kind of crazy rant about people trying to kill him. And maybe he thought, this is the person that's trying to kill me. And he started to attack this person. So they automatically were like, hey, what the heck, you know? So they start defending themselves. And they were so freaked out and afraid that they ran away. Maybe he's telling them, hey, the CIA's after me, the Canadian government, the German government. Maybe he's telling them such a crazy story that they become so afraid that they don't come forward. Because, and maybe the the... Sexual assault wasn't an assault at all. Maybe it was a mutual hookup. But like they said, they, they, they did not name whether or not they had found any DNA. So the fact that he had his pants off was the big indicator to them that, he, that this was a sexual thing. He may have just started saying, you know, if he was in some kind of schizophrenic state of mind... He could have just said, i got to get these clothes off of me, you know. The, the government is tracing me through my clothes or something. We don't know, you know. We don't know what people go through at that time. Now, this person goes on to tell the story. Um, maybe he was just in a bad part of town and felt like everyone was watching him. He may, in his state of mind, he may have thought that someone was following him and that he began to run. And But here's the thing to whoever wrote this. Somebody beat the shit out of this man. Somebody hit him so hard in his stomach that it ruptured and perforated his stomach to the point that he died from a busted stomach. He had a gash across his forehead from a crowbar or some other type of device of that nature. The fact that the police said money and his ID and things were scattered hundreds of yards away from him is that maybe someone in a truck was chasing him. Maybe he was actually in a car with somebody. And this person, he jumped out of the car trying to get away from them and they come to a stop they get out they follow him back he's running away you know and they start beating the crap out of him maybe him taking his paints and stuff off happened after this blow um maybe he was in the process of trying to get these clothes off of him because he was in so much pain from this stomach blow that he you know just lay there and died I don't know, I, I'm just giving different theories, but whoever this person is, is trying to say that, you know, um, someone may have come across him and he's in this panic state of mind and they freak out, they're going to rob him, but then he becomes so irate and, ir and his behavior is so erratic that they, it scares them to the point that they just beat him up and leave. I don't know that. Um, here's a theory that someone in the comments says is it possible that the tow truck driver guy being that he would have had access to a truck and a crowbar and things like that is it possible that either he or someone that he that worked for him overheard this guy talking about having all this cash on him maybe they saw him taking this cash out of his back fanny pack, or maybe even somebody who was at that hotel that night that he was checking in, and he's waving around cash, you know? Is it possible that somebody was following him um, for the money and, and then just, you know, for whatever reason didn't take the money because they were like, you know, this is going to get back. Maybe they didn't intend to kill him, you know. And maybe they just intended to beat the crap out of him and take the money. And he fought back 
to the point that they just fled the scene. I don't know. It's just different theories going around, you know. This person says that it was no mystery where he was going. If he took I-81 to, to I-40, he would have continued on eventually hooking up on I-75 to Atlanta. Strawberry Plains is not downtown, and it's not near the University of Tennessee. It's farmland and maybe a point five square mile of truck stops, gas stations, and hotels. Now, I've been to Knoxville. When you're coming out of Knoxville, like you're driving toward Gatlinburg, toward the Smoky Mountains, you will come through Strawberry Plains. It's... Um, it's like this person says, it's not in the downtown area of Knoxville. Knoxville is not a huge town. Um, the part of Knoxville that I was in was around the Market Square, Tennessee Theater, and I've been out on the highway coming back from Knoxville. Um, Strawberry Plains, I think, if I'm not mistaken, and I could be, is more of a, like a rural area, and I think that there's like a flea, maybe a big flea market in that area. It is not considered a bad part of town, so this person's theory is that he was being chased by junkies and thugs from this uh, bad part of town. Um, continue on to see what other comments are. The term victim blaming refers to finding fault with the behavior or appearance of someone who has been harmed by another person. Um, so it's like they're saying his own behavior caused his death. It's possible that his own behavior caused his death only in the fact that maybe he encountered somebody, came upon them and started like he was acting so erratic that they freaked out but most people in that situation would have just took off running and screaming help help you know <laughs> instead of beating the crap out of somebody and beating them so hard that they end up dead but I've talked about this long enough I'm just going through some of the comments um Here's another thing someone else said, the same thing I just got done saying. They theorized that he pulled his pants down himself because he was in pain from the stomach blow. Maybe he felt like he had to use the bathroom, you know. He now, it says that in the, the TV show Unsolved Mysteries, it talks a little bit more about the sexual assault aspect and that it showed that he did have anal penetration. So there had to, there didn't necessarily have to be DNA, you know. Blair was staying at a hotel on the same street as the Cracker Barrel, so he didn't have a very far walk. And this is from the user DJHJR86 on Reddit. Blair walked over to the truck stop to get something to eat. Uh, I don't know about that. Were, there, were they interviewing anybody at the Cracker Barrel? Did he come in? Did he sit down at a table? Did a waitress wait on him? Did anyone at the pilot remember him coming in? Did they have cameras? These would be questions that the police would have asked. This is this person's theory. He walked into the truck stop to get something to eat and was accosted by a prostitute and possibly a pimp. They planned to rob him and, and thought that he was an easy target. Now listen, if you're a man from out of town and you've paid $100 for a hotel room and you're going to go pick up a prostitute at a truck stop, you're not going to go to a construction site down the street you're going to go to your hotel room and have sex with this person and send them on their way with their money you know and if they're going to rob you 
they're probably going to rob you before you ever make it back to your hotel. Maybe that's this person's theory, is that they were walking back to the hotel, you know? I don't, I really don't think that that was the case at all. The criminal theory is that someone in that town saw him with this money, whether it was someone who was hanging around the hotel, the guys from the, maybe someone at the car uh, gas station where he stopped and claimed to have lost his key. Um, maybe the man himself who drove the tow truck or one of his employees. Or maybe it was just this guy was wandering around town aimlessly. You know, maybe he was afraid to go to this hotel room because he thought somebody was after him and maybe they were going to find him there. So he was trying to throw him off by wandering around town all night. I don't know. Um, how he ended up on a construction site, I don't know. But the fact that he himself was also a construction worker, maybe he became confused. Maybe he was in a state of schizophrenia or something and he thought he was at work and he shows up uh, at this place. I would have thought that maybe they would have fences up around these types of places. I don't know. Maybe one day they will run that higher, the only real DNA evidence that they seem to have. I don't know if they checked this man's fingernails, um, if there was anything that maybe indicated that he had fought back. He had, uh, you know, it said he had deep wounds on his hands, so he had been trying to, like, hold off someone from hitting him. Is it possible that he was able to grab onto that person in some way? Or maybe he landed a punch and there might be some DNA on his hands. I don't know. This has been, what, 30 years ago? 25 years ago? 26? So, I don't know. Maybe one day that her will show up in the database and it will match somebody and they will be able to at least come up with a profile of who it could possibly have been. Um... Cases seem to get solved so quickly anymore. But this is one case that where someone, someone out there has walked around free for the last 20 plus years, almost 26 years. And uh, so maybe they will the rest of their life, you know. Thanks for listening.